and welcome everyone. We're so glad to have all of you with us today. We have a nice big crowd today and we're excited to worship with you and just praise a God who loves us and can heal all our pain and our worries and we have so much to be thankful for. So would you please stand and join us? You are holy. Yeah. 
so grateful uh, to know that you are what we've always desired and as we gather for worship we sing these songs that talk about how the world doesn't hold anything for us but we also have to confess Lord um, our hearts have gone astray our minds have wandered um, and we have sought lesser things but thank you for this time of worship it redirects our minds and our hearts to the truth to you and so we love you, Lord. We worship you. Thank you by your grace that you've made all this possible. Uh, may you be glorified in us as we worship you this day. 
In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. At this time, we invite the young people who would like to go to Kids Church to be dismissed. That's uh, grades kindergarten through fourth grade. There's a special program upstairs just for you, and you can go to get ready to participate in that at this time. According to A.W. Tozer, he has stated, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about us. So what comes into your mind when you think about God? Do you think of a white-haired grandpa figure? Or maybe a Wizard of Oz type man behind the curtain? Or maybe a genie in a bottle type figure? Or some other image? To prepare for our prayer time, I invite you to listen carefully as I read the Bible and we see what uh, King David had to say about what God is like from 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 13, which says, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is a kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of all things, and in your hand are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we thank you, and we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. What can we learn from these words from 1 Chronicles chapter 29? In this passage, King David identifies several characteristics of God as he leads the nation Israel in praying and worshiping God. He lists that God is everlasting, that God is great, that God has power, that God has glory, that God has majesty, that he is splendor, he is owner, he is head, and he is ruler. The truth of these attributes of God should influence our prayers, and we should be mindful of these concepts as we worship before the Lord and pray as a church family. We are praying to someone who is mighty and powerful. We already have joys and concerns and testimonies that were shared in our earlier worship service that we'll include during our prayer time together. And we have cards that have been turned in and some items that have been shared verbally with the pastoral staff for our prayer time. But we welcome the joys and concerns that you would share, as well as and especially testimonies about what God is doing in and through your life and the lives of other people. Whatever's on your heart, we want to share together in our prayer time. What would you share as a prayer joy, concern, or testimony that we could include during our prayer time? We welcome the things that are on your heart. Yes. <laughs> welcome. We're glad you're here. Go ahead. Well, we'll pray with you, and it's good to see you. God bless you. Thank you for sharing that. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies? Yes.
we'll pray for her and thank you for that testimony of the positive influence that she's had. You bet. Thank you. Other choice, concerns, and testimonies with us. That's great. God bless them, and we're happy for you and your family tree. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies, whatever's on your heart. Donna. That's neat. That's super. What a gift of God that... Uh, has been given and we rejoice with you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a minute uh, following a pattern of prayer or outline with the letters of the word pray as the outline of this prayer uh, with P representing praise, R representing repent, A representing ask, and Y representing yield. I want to encourage you to be praying on your own. I'll offer some suggestions. But pray however God prompts you in your own heart to pray to him. As I'm praying, I invite you to express your own praise to God in your own heart, however he prompts you. We do pray following the example of David from the passage we read in which he said, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is a kingdom and you are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things and your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Lord, we lift our hearts, we lift our hands. We praise your name, praise God, praise God. We move on in our prayers to a time to focus on repenting. I invite you to pray in your own heart to God, repenting in your own relationship with him, however he prompts you. We seek the forgiveness that only God can grant. Luke 18, 13 reminds us that tax collector stood at a distance and he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me. A sinner. God, we do appeal to your mercy and we do acknowledge that we are sinners. Therefore, I repent and I confess my own sin and I seek your mercy, washing and cleansing. It's only by the blood of Jesus that we have any hope of forgiveness and cleansing. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. We can't pay it back. It's just by grace based on your mercy. As we move on in our prayers to a time of asking, I invite you to talk to God in your own heart, asking him whatever he prompts you. Praise God for this church family and the opportunity to share together on our spiritual journey. Help us as we seek to encourage and help one another. Thank you for the acceptance and the love that we can share we all need that lord lord we rejoice with the news of several recent births we pray along with donna and her family and thank you for the birth of tinley gift of god blessing that has been granted to her family tree we pray you'd be with that family and we share also in joy with the clint and his family as a niece was born we're glad to hear the mom and baby are doing well, and we pray for them likewise, that you would uh, show yourself strong on their behalf to help and encourage. Thank you for the testimony of Angela about Catherine and her influence and about her future plans. We pray that you'd be with Catherine and guide, guard, and director. 
Help her with all the things you have in store for her in the future. God, we rejoice and are glad to share with uh, Eric and Casey and their family, and we pray you continue to be with them as they continue to adjust and carny to the ministry and opportunity you've called them to there. Provide for them and guide them to a church home that will work for them and their family. Show yourself strong on their behalf, we pray. We pray along with Beaver Yuri for her brother-in-law who fell and broke his pelvis. Heal him, we pray. Help him, we pray. We pray along with Carrie Wiles for grandmother who is going to be having surgery this next week. Help her, we pray. We give you praise for the holiday last week, for President's Day last Monday. We give you praise for the Kleist program that started last Wednesday and the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of young people. We pray for the coordinators and teachers and helpers and students that they will continue to experience your blessing. We thank you for the couples going to Weekend to Remember, some this weekend in Kansas City right now. Bless them, we pray, and some going in a few weeks on March 10th through the 12th. Be with all of them to help them to experience the encouragement you have in store for them. We thank you for many ladies from our church family who were able to attend the Manhattan Christian College Women's World Conference this Friday and Saturday. Use the inspiration that they experienced to make a difference in their lives. We give you praise for the wedding of Haley Thompson and Jason Nelson right here in this sanctuary yesterday. Be with them, we pray. Bless them and encourage them. We thank you for the many small groups and Sunday school opportunities to help people grow. We pray for Diane Coleman that you would help her in her recovery following eye surgery. Help her to be patient as she heals. We pray for John Redman as he was in the hospital last week. Continue to show yourself strong on his behalf. We pray for Will Hutchie for healing and recovery following hernia surgery last week. Help him, we pray. Protect him from any complications. We pray for the youth pastor search team as they continue their process. Give them wisdom and direction. We want to remember the families of those who have experienced the passing of loved ones. And we pray along with Tracy Anders as her cousin passed away after a long battle with uh, cancer this last week. And he happened to also be the dad of a high school wrestler who chose to honor his dad by going on to the state wrestling tournament even though his dad had just passed away and he was blessed to be the champion in the 4A 170 pound division so we have both a joy and a sorrow in that family we send prayers for comfort and your strength for them as they adjust to the passing of a loved one we pray for the family of Joni Fraser as her funeral was last week. We pray for the family of Dean Haddock as he passed away recently. We want to lift up the family of Lita Adams and Joletta Cook and pray for them to experience grace and peace from you. We pray for the family of Linda Smith's dad, Nicholas Peters, as he passed away and his funeral will be this next week. Uh, for each of these families, send comfort and peace that passes understanding. And help us as a church family to reach out with love and support and care for those who have experienced loss. We pray you be with Pastor Cliff as he shares your truth today. Allow him to be anointed, filled, and a channel of your truth and blessing as he teaches from your word. We pray that your spirit would be present to prompt the heart of each one of us who hears that we may sense your direction and guidance on the next step for each of us on our spiritual journey. Be with us, we pray. Thank you, Lord. As we move on in our prayers to a time of yielding, I invite you to each talk to God in your own heart, yielding to him however he prompts you. God of creation, 
May this eternal truth be always on our hearts that the God who breathed this world into being, placed stars into the heavens and designed the butterfly's wings is the same God who entrusted his son to the care of ordinary people and became vulnerable that we may know how strong is the wonder of love, a mystery so deep that it's impossible to grasp, a mystery so beautiful that it's impossible to ignore. I pray all these things in the blessed and holy name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, this is a time of our service where we'll take communion. Um, the only requirement we have that you join join us in communion is that you've received Christ as your as your Lord and Savior. Um, if you have done so, we invite you to join us. Uh, we just ask that you hold the elements after the deacons have passed them out, and so we can take them together as a church family. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, here we are, a group of sinners, but we take this time to uh, come to you with repentant hearts. Um, we take this time to remember uh, what your Son Christ has done for us on the cross, the price that he has paid uh, to give us forgiveness of sins. Um, Lord, we just pray that uh, this process um, can change our hearts um, as we choose to renew ourselves, uh, to, to turn to you, to serve you. Um, Lord, we just pray that we, be, we can become more like you um, and that you would bless this opportunity that we have here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the body. Let's see. 
While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And now we will uh, receive our offering. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we are your servants. We are actually stewards of all that you uh, have given us, all that you provide us with. Uh, and this means that we are servants in your kingdom uh, to use these items, these, uh, whether it be abilities, our desires, our talents, or even the physical things that you give us, uh, that we use them wisely uh, within your kingdom. And Lord, I just pray that, um, that you will bless this opportunity that we have here this morning to receive a, a financial offering uh, that helps us uh, continue our mission here at this church to make disciples for Christ. I just pray that you bless this offering unto your service. In Jesus' name, amen. Every day is bound before you, it is so- 
Amen. Thank you, praise team. Good morning, church. You guys look awesome today. Thank you for coming out and worshiping with us. Uh, It's always a pleasure. Uh, It's a joy uh, to be able to worship God together. If you're visiting with us, a special welcome to you. We pray that uh, you'll have time. We can get to know you. Uh, We're glad that you're here today. I want to get to our message. Um, Just to highlight, though, in your bulletin announcements, we don't want you to miss a couple things. Um, There is a ladies' game night coming up um, on March the 10th. Uh, ladies' night out, game night here at the church at 6.30 on a Friday night. There is a sign-up sheet out at the Welcome Center, but just to clarify, even if you don't sign up, you are still welcome to come. They're just trying to get an idea of the numbers on that, so please consider that as uh, something uh, to participate in and enjoy. Also, I want you to know, uh, like Pastor Dave mentioned, this weekend is uh, wrapping up one of the weekend to remember. There's another one coming up uh, March 10th through the 12th, so it's not too late if you are interested in going. And what we've committed to as a church, our elders uh, committed to this early uh, this year, actually at the end of last year, to send our couples knowing that it can be a financial burden. We have money available. We want to get you to this weekend, if at all possible. So if you're interested, um, just talk with uh, either myself or Pastor Dave, and we would love to get you set up for that uh, weekend conference, weekend to remember March 10th through the 12th. There are other announcements, but I want to move on and uh, get to our message if I can. So if you have a Bible, you'll find this helpful to follow along in your own Bible. We will have it up on the screen here. And we do want to mention again, if you are here, you don't have a Bible of your own, just talk with us after the service. Out at the Welcome Center, we have Bibles to give you, one to keep as your own, um, because we believe strongly that uh, it's that important, that God will speak to you um, through his word. So... I'm going to read verses 18 through 22 of Mark chapter 2. We're in a series, we're working our way through this gospel, um, and it's kind of small sections that we're taking here, but there's a lot packed into this, and so I want to get right to that. Mark chapter 2, 18 through 22, and remembering as you listen, this is God's word. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting and yours are not? Jesus answered, well, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Let's take a moment just to pray. Again, Lord, we're grateful that you're right here uh, with us as we worship and sing and pray and read, um, that you are here with us. It's a great grace. We don't deserve it, but we pray, God, um, that we would be blessed, not only that you're present, but that you would speak. And so would you take these words that we've just read, and by your Holy Spirit, by the power of your Spirit, work them deep. Go deep in our minds and our hearts, God, and touch us where life matters the most. You know each one of us here personally, in detail, and so we have confidence, God, that you'll speak to us and change us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope um, one of the benefits of working through a book, a series like this, is that you can see progression, that there's progression in the way that the author, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Um, writes uh, the accounts of what really happened with Jesus and his disciples. And one of the things I think you can see if you've been with us through this series so far is how Jesus, according to the religious leaders and people of his time, um, didn't know how to do it. He was getting it wrong all the time. Everything that they knew as an established way of trying to be a good person, try to, to be close to God, Jesus was doing it backwards. 
And we saw that even from the very beginning in this series where Jesus calls his disciples. We said that is so backwards to the way that they did it in Jesus' time. For the most part, you worked hard to become a good student of Scripture, someone who gained a certain amount of worth in your pursuit of God so that then the student would go to a rabbi and say, can I become your disciple? Can I follow you? Jesus reverses that whole thing because he looks out and he says, hey, I see some fishermen. I see a tax collector. I see people that did not make the cut. I see people who were not good enough to be disciples. And I call you, he says, come follow me. It was backwards. Jesus did it backwards again when there's a leper who needs healing, and the religious people of the time said, hey, we know what to do with lepers. You steer clear of them. You you don't go near a leper. They are not only physically unclean, they're spiritually unclean. So they have to holler unclean so that you can steer clear. And Jesus doesn't do it right again. He goes up to the leper. He actually touches the leper before he heals him. And then he brings healing not only to his body but to his soul. And Jesus gets it wrong in so many ways from the view of the religious people That even when he has called Matthew or Levi, his disciple, uh, tax collector, to come and be his disciple, Levi has a party for him, a dinner party, but it's filled with tax collectors and sinners. And again, this whole idea of spiritually you can be pure before God, but you got to be careful because if you get too close to people who aren't very good, who aren't very spiritual, you are going to get infected. And Jesus reverses religion because he says, I have come not to steer clear of the sick and the needy, but to come and heal them. My cleanness, he says, overcomes your deepest level of impurity and uncleanness. I give you the good infection, Jesus says. So he keeps reversing it. Now he does it again. Here in our text here, and by the way, every time this happens, you can kind of sense there he's ratcheting up the uh, kind of the antagonism of people who are like, this is wrong. Jesus, what are you doing wrong this time? Well, Jesus, we've noticed you like to eat. You like to eat and drink a lot. In fact, the context of this is from last week. We talked about the party, the dinner party at Levi's house. Jesus and his disciples apparently are eating and drinking freely. Later on in his uh, ministry, Jesus will actually be accused of being a, a glutton and a drunkard because it seems like he's always eating. Well, why is that a problem? Well, spiritually, if you want to be a really good religious person, you've got to fast regularly. So we're going to talk about fasting, and I've got a lot of ground to cover here, but the idea here is that, Jesus, you're doing it wrong again because you don't seem to fast at all, and that means, by extension, your disciples don't. Remember, a disciple is not somebody who just listens and agrees in their head with what their teacher says, but watches and imitates them in every way. Jesus isn't fasting, so therefore his disciples aren't fasting. And Jesus, why don't you do that? They actually ask this question then, why not fast? Now, some context here, and some of you may not be familiar with fasting, so let me just cover a little ground with that. The fasting idea here is, it was done, um, it was actually commanded in the Old Testament law, only one time in the law do you find it specifically commanded that God's people should fast, and in the most technical sense of that, it meant to abstain willingly, intentionally, from eating food for a period of time. And in the Old Testament law, the one time that that was told that they were supposed to do that, the Israelites were told on the Day of Atonement, on Yom Kippur, that Day of Atonement, the one day where the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies, it's the only day he can do it, fast on that day, that God's people should not eat on the Day of Atonement. Nowhere else in in Scripture is it commanded in the law, but over time, you see God's people add fasting on a more regular basis. One of the things that the Jews did was when they would hit a particularly difficult time in their history. For instance, when the temple is destroyed because the nation is overrun by um, invaders, they remembered that years later they would commemorate that day. It was sort of their 9-11 or Pearl Harbor, but only worse because it wasn't just a single attack. It was remembering we lost not only the temple, we lost our land. We were exiled. And to remember that, there was a longing for God to restore, for God to overcome those things. And part of the longing gets expressed in fasting. And so they would fast on a particular day that remembered when the temple was destroyed. And by Jesus' time, 
if you were really spiritual, you would fast like the Pharisees regularly every week, twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays. You were fasting, not eating food. And people come to expect that, hey, if you're really good spiritually, that's what you do. And we've noticed Jesus, I don't know, maybe the dinner party was on a Monday. Maybe the dinner party was on a Thursday. But we know that Jesus was eating and it drew their attention. Why not? Why do this backwards too? Not only was fasting was this expression of longing for God to make things right, but it was something that was done in particular to reveal our hearts. And this is really true even today. The reason that anyone would fast, and by the way, you can fast in more than one way nowadays. We talk about, you know, you, you may not eat. You know, those are good things that you abstain from. But some people fast. I've heard some of you say you're fasting from Facebook. So that's why you're shaking a little bit over there. Your arm is like, i got to get to my phone. i got to get to look at Facebook. And you're fasting from that. Good job. That's fantastic. But when you fast from those things, what it's intended to do, what fasting was intended to do always, is reveal our hearts. Like bring to the surface what's already there. And that's why if you've ever tried to fast, if you've ever gone without food, and maybe sometimes it wasn't intentional, that's not a fast, that's just missing food for a while, but when you get a certain level of it, you ever get this phrase, uh, maybe this never happens to you, but it does for me, you ever get hangry? You ever get, you're so hungry that your anger starts to come out, and you're like, hey, I'm just sorry, I, I'm just hangry, I'm really hangry today, because I'm really, really hungry, and I haven't been able to eat, and so hangry becomes my, what, what it's really doing is saying, when I don't have food, my heart gets exposed, see? I get this anger that's already there, by the way. We think, well, I'm angry because I'm not getting the food I need. The anger's already there. The hunger just reveals it. That's what fasting was meant to do, was actually to reveal our hearts. Now, in Jesus' time and in ours, it gets twisted so that Jesus taught very specifically, look, I know you guys fast a lot. When you fast, he says, don't do it so that people notice like, you probably shouldn't know that I'm going to be fasting every Monday and Thursday, Jesus said, because if you're doing it so that people will think highly of you, that they'll think, wow, that's impressive. You know, I, I go without, I go from all the way from breakfast to lunch and not eat anything, and I think that's a big accomplishment. You guys are going Mondays and Thursdays, fantastic. Jesus says there's a part of your heart that will love that, that will say, hey, that feels pretty good, that people think pretty highly of me because I fast. Did you know I'm fasting? Did you know I'm not eating anything? I'm doing that all about for God. But it's not really. Jesus says you're getting it to get a reward from people. And he says, and that's the only reward you're going to get from it. If you don't do it with the intent to say, what this is saying is, God, I really want you. I want to long for you above all else. You guys sang it so well in these songs that our praise team had for us. Nothing else compares. That This is the God that I desire above all else. And Fasting was a way to kind of help our hearts check in and say, is that really true? I can sing it, but is that really true, that I desire you above all else? So there's this longing for God. That's exactly why when Jesus is asked, so how come you and your disciples aren't fasting? That Jesus, now he's going to give us three word pictures here, but the first one is of a bridegroom where Jesus says, well, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them. They cannot so long as they have him with them. In other words, Jesus is trying to say there's, there's a joy that happens when you have what is most important to you. When you have what you long for the most, what you desire the most, when you have it, or in Jesus' case, when you have him, he said it's not even appropriate to fast then. He said it's sort of this weird idea that they would continue to long when they, he, I'm right here. They can't fast at this point, he says, because what they have ultimately ever wanted in life is right here in me, and I'm with them. It would be sort of like, how weird would this be? He's, he gives us the picture of a wedding, you know, a bridegroom and a, and a, a bride, and, and why we just had a wedding yesterday, well, Haley Thompson's wedding, and and I'm thinking, it always is the same. We do these weddings, and by the time you finish the ceremony, the, the bride and the groom are wasted. I mean, they're just exhausted, and they just are like, finally, we finish the end of the service. I get to announce, and I'll present to you, hey, this is Mr. and Mrs. Jason Nelson. Everybody goes crazy. And I can see the relief come over their face because it's sort of like, I made it through. 
we're married, and now we can move on to the reception. Because everybody wants to get to the reception, right? Why? Well, because it's fantastic. It's a celebration. There's, there's food, there's, there's all kinds of dancing, and there's great fellowship, and there's a... Imagine, I was thinking about this last night with this message, I'm thinking, what if they said, all right, everybody, we're going to go off to the reception, we're going down to Down Under, we're going to have a great reception, and by the way, we're fasting. <laughs> There's going to be zero food there. It's going to be a great time, we're gonna, it's going to be awesome. Everybody's like, well, that's an odd way to celebrate, isn't it? Jesus is saying the same thing here. He's saying, how can they fast when I am what they have always ever wanted, and I'm right here. In fact, what Jesus is saying is, the very fact that you guys caught this, this is good, he says, you've noticed, these guys are not fasting, it is a sign that God is present among them. One of the signs of fellowship, one of the signs that God is with us, is that there is a joy, and we always say this, this is so important, joy is so much different than happiness. Happiness is about what my external circumstances are doing. So I can be pretty unhappy many days, but even in the unhappiness, there is an undercurrent of joy when you know I have what matters most. And Jesus says, these guys have it. It wouldn't make any sense for them to fast when I'm here with them. And so it sounds in a way that Jesus would be saying, it would be natural for us to hear that and say, so I guess Jesus just did away with fasting because Jesus has come, right? Right? Not quite. Verse 20. Feasting is a sign that, that of the joy that God gives us when he comes and, and is with us in Christ, but fasting is still a sign of the joy that Jesus provides. Jesus puts it this way. So I'm the bridegroom, I'm with him. It's like we're at the, the reception, and of course there's great joy and celebration, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. And by the way, that is pretty violent language that Jesus is using. He's saying, imagine you're at the reception and you have the bride and the groom and the bridegroom is there and in the middle of the reception, can you imagine this? If someone came and by force took away the bridegroom, removed him from the reception and everybody would see that happen, it would be traumatic, it would be violent. What's happening? The bridegroom being taken away from us. Jesus says that's an important picture and really, this is the first indication in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is saying, I have come, and I have come to die. This is the first indication we have of Jesus saying, this is a reference to there's going to come a time when people will lay hands on the Son of Man and take him away and be crucified. And so in that, Jesus says, so a time is coming when he will be taken from that, and on that day they will fast. Ah, so Jesus is saying, on those few days between his death after, the, after being crucified and his resurrection, got a couple days in there, Jesus is saying maybe that that is when fasting would be appropriate because he's, he's, he's died, he's away from them now. The disciples are mourning because they long again for Jesus who was taken from them. And some people say, so we don't fast now because that was just for those couple of days between. I would argue that there's still a place for fasting today amongst the people of God who have Jesus Christ living in you. You're like, well, that's a little odd. If, but I take that in, from two ways from Scripture. One, most of the New Testament, although it talks almost not at all about fasting, which gives you an indication most Christians, most churches were not fasting as much as maybe they had before they came to know Christ. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. Acts chapter 13 and 14 talks about the churches in the book of Acts that were fasting at various times. So they were fasting. This is after Jesus' resurrection. And what really seals it for me is that Jesus uses that same metaphor that he's the bridegroom, the bride of Christ, the church, his disciples. And he says, so my second coming, when I come back, that is going to be like the bridegroom. Matthew 25 says it's like the bridegroom coming back. And this begins then to make sense of a lot of things that Jesus would say to his disciples like in John 14. In John 14, it's before his death and resurrection, but he says to his disciples, I'm going away. I know that troubles you. Don't be troubled. He says, I'm going away, but I'm going away to prepare a place for you. That's bridegroom language, by the way. 
In Jesus' day, you would have this kind of engagement that would happen. Remember Mary and Joseph? They're pledged to be married. They're engaged to be married, but they're not really married. <clears throat> and then they consummate the marriage later. What's that all about? Well, normally what would happen is that was about as good as being married when you were pledged to be married. But in the in-between time, from your engagement to the actual wedding consummation, <coughs> excuse me, you would have the bridegroom go away. And he'd say, I'm going to my father's house, and I'm going to build an addition to my father's house. And that's where me and my, gr and my bride are going to live. <coughs> and so in that moment, when Jesus says, I'm going away, but I'm going to prepare a place for you, they would be like, hey, that sounds a lot like bridegroom and groom. And, and brides, you, you have the same idea. You're going away to prepare a place, and then we'll be consummated later. Yes. So I think Jesus is saying, you and I are in this in-between time. The Bible says clearly, you, if you've accepted Christ, Christ is in you. The presence of Jesus Christ lives in you through the Holy Spirit. At the same time, you and I don't experience the fullness of his presence yet because we still don't see him face to face. We still are not knowing him like we are known, the Bible says. And so you have this picture of he's with us but there's more to come, a greater fullness to come. And this would open the door then for a longing expressed through fasting. You're like, wasn't well, Jesus with you? Why are you fasting? Yeah, but not fully yet. <coughs> One way to think about this is fasting is a way to remind ourselves not to get full on lesser things. If you invite me over to your house for dinner, some of you have been brave enough to do that, um, I, I enjoy that, and if you serve some of my favorite food, if you serve steak, mashed potatoes, or baked potatoes, and you got sour cream and all that good stuff, and I'm eating there, and we're enjoying it, so, oh, I love this kind of food. If you, in that moment, say, by the way, Cliff, we do have dessert. And it's like, hmm, interesting. What is it? Wh what's the dessert? Now, if you say to me, oh, we put together this wonderful jello salad. That's awesome. Can I have a little bit more steak right now? Can I have a little bit more of that? See, because if you tell me that, but now, if I'm there, I'm eating at your plate, and I'm eating the steak, and I love the steak. It's my favorite meal. And I say, what's for, what's for us, um, dessert? And you say, well, and if you tell me a good, solid, biblical food like pie, if you say, yeah, we're going to have pie after this, then you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, man, I have a little more room for some steak, but I'm going to hold off because I don't want to get filled up on that and miss the very best stuff. <coughs> when Jesus is saying to his disciples, I'm going away, they know he's what I've always ever wanted. Everything else in this life is lesser stuff. Don't get filled up on the lesser stuff and miss what you've really always wanted in Jesus Christ. So, fasting is still an option for us today where we say, well, I'm, I'm going to express my longing because it's not completely fulfilled yet, and I don't want to get filled up on that stuff. So, that sounds great, so we still fast some. Here's the other thing, though. Jesus says, but when you do it now, you do it differently. You guys, it's a new way of fasting. Here's the way it works. It's not fasting because you've never tasted it. It's fasting because you've had a taste of Jesus Christ, and it gets so sweet sometimes, doesn't it? Some of you experience this in worship. You have a great conference, you have a great worship here, and you're like, oh, I felt like God was right there. Some of you experience this in a prayer time. Some of you in your small groups are experiencing the presence of God so strong, and you're like, that is so sweet, and you long for it. That's what I really want. And Jesus says, but when you fast now, you, you just know you're just getting a taste. So fast in a new way, but don't miss, please don't miss the biggest thing that Jesus is saying here. I'm giving you these metaphors, he says, bridegroom. And then he throws in cloth, new cloth versus old cloth, and new wine, old wineskins. What he's saying is, don't just try to fast in a new way by adding me to your life. You can't just add me to your life. <coughs> what you need to do, he says, is be made new. You have to experience a transformation that starts on the inside and works its way out because if you just try to add me, he says, and this is where we get these metaphors that Jesus uses, you're going to have to be made new for this to have any impact, lasting impact on you. 
It's not just adding something new, it's being made new. So you have a new piece of cloth, it hasn't shrunk yet, it's like buying the new jeans or the new shirt. My wife says, don't throw it in the, in the dryer, you throw it in the dryer, why not? Because it comes out and you can't wear it, it's all shrunk down, it's got to nothing. Jesus is saying, I'm the new cloth. If you put new cloth on old, it's going to shrink and pull away. If you put, I'm the new wine, he says, put the new and the old wineskins, which were these kind of leather things that <coughs> would expand, but they would often lose their elasticity over time. He said, if you put in an old one, the fermentation of that wine is going to expand, it's going to break, but if you put it in a new wineskin, it has the ability to expand. He says, so it's not enough to patch me into your life. <coughs> it's not enough to add me and say, okay, God, I've got a few issues, so if you could fix that stuff, I would like to have you in my life. And Jesus is saying, it's, it's got to go deeper. You have to be made new, because it's actually dangerous. It's actually dangerous to try to do the right thing for the wrong reason. See, if I try to just add Jesus to do the right thing, but it's for the wrong motive, the wrong reason, it's very dangerous. You're like, how is it dangerous? Like this, try it this way. Those of you who are married, <coughs> significant other in your life, if an anniversary comes around or a birthday, do this. Just actually, I would enjoy if you did this. Uh, <laughs> say this to them. Do I have to take you out to eat for our anniversary? Please, just, just say that. Just see what happens. Do I have to? I will. I'll do that. I don't really want to, but I will take you out for our anniversary. Do I have to do that? You will find that it's dangerous to do the right thing for the wrong reason because you'll also find out there's a lot of other things you don't have to. Like she might say, yeah, you don't have to sleep in the same bed with me. You can sleep on the couch tonight. You know, you don't have to have your meals made for you. You can make them yourself. There's a lot of things you don't have to do that get revealed when you do the right thing for the wrong reason. And Jesus is saying, new fasting is not about trying to just add me you're going to have to be made new from the inside out. That's why Jesus would say things like, you know what, if you have bad fruit coming off of a tree, the thing to do is not to take the bad fruit and try to shine it up, try to polish it up, try to make it look better. He says the only real solution to this is you need a better tree. You need a new tree. A bad tree is going to bear bad fruit, he says. A good tree is going to bear good fruit. You have to be changed fundamentally from a bad tree to a good tree. That kind of change that runs deep makes all the difference in the world, whether you're fasting or feasting or whatever you do. I used to think, well, there was a lot of confusion. Well, how do you be made new in Christ? Because some people think, does that mean I have to act really weird? Do I have to act like I'm not? Like if you're an introvert, <clears throat> does that mean I've got to be an, an extrovert now? That, that just makes you crazy. Oh, I've got to start acting like I'm not even... I like to put it this way. You get to keep your personality, but you can't keep your heart. You get to keep your personality. If your personality is extroverted, you're still going to be an extrovert. If, for the instance, the Apostle Paul, before he came to Christ, he was a stubborn, determined man. His personality was type A, 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 A. He was a guy who was like, I'm going to make this happen by sheer will and determination. Before he came to, to Jesus, how he, did, how he used his personality was he wanted to wipe out the church. After he comes to Jesus, guess what? He is now stubborn for Jesus. He is determined for Jesus. And instead of wiping out the church, he builds the church all over the world. Here, Jesus says, keep your personality. I made you that way. You don't have to apologize for your personality, but you have to have a heart transplant. And I will give you, Jesus says, my heart, which means my desires become your desires. My will becomes your will. What you've ever wanted now becomes something that is expressed through my life in you. From the outside, it doesn't look like a lot of things are different when we talk about this new life, because if you're a teacher... Before you come to Christ, guess what you're going to do after you come to Christ? Unless he changes this on you, but teachers, you're still going to teach. If you're a farmer, you're still going to farm. If you're a plumber, you're still going to plumb. 
You know, you're going to keep doing the things that you've always done before, but on the outside it looks exactly the same, but it's so much different when it's coming from the inside out because now you say, I'm not doing my work to gain a sense of identity. I'm not doing my work to impress other people. I'm not doing my work so that I gain a certain measure of success. I'm not doing my work to earn the money so I have some kind of security. In fact, I'm working at my work now, but I do it as unto the Lord. I'm working for Him. That's the difference. That's the newness. And Jesus says, <coughs> I have the capacity to take you and make you new, <coughs> to change your life from the inside out. And then what, means is, what that means is you're going to experience joy in the places you never thought. Let me close with this. There are two ways that I see this metaphor that Jesus gave us. And it's kind of weird that he chose two that are so opposite. Do you catch this? The, shrunk, the, the cloth that shrinks. Jesus is the new cloth, which means when it gets washed, it's going to shrink, right? Which means Jesus is shrinking <laughs> in this metaphor. Jesus is shrinking. But he's saying, if you're not made new, that's going to just pull away from your life. If you're made new, you'll be pulled to me. And he says the other metaphor is what? Is not being shrunk, but actually expanding. It's the new wine. Jesus is a new wine, and it's going to expand. And if the old life, you're just trying to add Jesus, it's going to burst it apart. It'll ruin it both. But if you have a new heart, a new life, he says now you're going to be able to expand, and you're going to experience joy both in Jesus pulling you nearer and in Jesus pushing you further than you ever thought possible. And let me just share this personal example for you, just to close us out with this. Because this is, uh, this is the way I've seen God do this in my own life. Um, some of you know I've shared this just a few times but, um, uh, with the church, but I became a Christian when I was 14 years old. And it happened because my mom became a Christian just shortly before then. It's such a dramatic change. And I saw the power of God and was drawn to God in that and accepted Christ when I was 14 years old. Not long after I became a Christian, at the age of 14, I was sexually abused by a man in the church. Actually, the man who helped lead my mom to Christ. Very, very confusing. Very confusing for me. And it was a horrible thing that happened, but <clears throat> I never told anybody. I never told my mom or my dad. Never told my siblings. Um, there was a lot of shame attached to that for me and a lot of fear. If I ever, oh, I don't want to share that with anybody. So I experienced that at age 14. When I left home at age 18, I never saw the man again who did that to me. And in my own mind, there was something that kind of clicked there where I said to God, I said, you know, it happened, it was horrible, but I'm okay. I'm okay, God. I'm, I, I really am. It's not affecting me. I'm going through my day. I'm trying to live for you. It, it's, I'm past it. I'm not going to let that thing define me, God, so I'm, I'm just moving on. Now, God is so patient in these things because here's where God, you know, begins a conversation over years with me. And he'd bring it up, sometimes in a sermon, sometimes in conversation with other believers, and God would just kind of bring it up, and Cliff, let's talk about that. I'm, I'm fine, God, <laughs> really. It's not a problem for me. And I continued like that for several years, and then I got married. And I got married about the age of 22, and, and um, I remember shortly after we were married that God brought it up again. And he said, uh, and God can be very stubborn about these sorts of things, so... He's like, I, I think you should tell Laura. And I said, you know, God, I, you know I've never told anybody about this. And I don't want this to be a problem in our marriage. I don't see why I need to do that. And I'm really, I had really convincing arguments uh, against God here to say, I, this is why I should not do this. But then God kind of hit me with this. He said, you're working against me. I said, what do you mean by that? I, you're working against me because, Cliff, when you got married, I committed to make the two of you one you've got this deep, dark secret that you think is not a problem, but you can't have that separate from your life with your wife. You need to share it with her. And so I fought God with that. It was not easy, <clears throat> but I, I shared it with Laura. And I remember it was, it was hard. It was difficult for me to talk about that with her, and yet she loved me. She, she welcomed that. She, she listened. She let me get mad. She let me get angry as I was recounting it and thinking about it some more. And, and in that moment where God, it felt to me, was pulling me, where Jesus was trying to pull me closer, 
in this one area. See, I wanted to kind of separate this out and say, this, this it doesn't really matter. It's not a problem. And Jesus is pulling. And he's like, Cliff, that's your old way of thinking. If you don't let go of that, it's going to tear. But if you let me pull you closer here, and I was kind of ticked off, to be honest, that God would press me on this. So I told my wife. She loved me through it. She hugged me. She cried with me. And I felt, it's funny, I was mad at God afterwards. I never felt quite, I, I felt as closer to God than I could ever remember before. That in that moment that Jesus was pulling me and it felt like I'm, he's tearing my life apart here in ways that I felt was unnecessary, I found joy. It's, uh, it's a weird thing, but there's a joy that was on the other side of it because suddenly there was a part of me that said, well, God, I guess maybe this affected me a little bit more because I suddenly felt a freedom. See, when you bring something out of the dark and you're able to start talking about it, it starts to lose its power over you. And when that started to happen, I didn't realize until that joy hit how bound I was by some of that stuff. And I thought, okay, man, Jesus really stretched me. He really pulled me here closer than I ever thought possible. But then Jesus continues, because I think that's as far as he's going to stretch in or pull in. And then he continues to hit me. And years later, do you remember this was, oh gosh, I don't know, was this seven, eight, nine years ago? Do you remember the whole thing that happened in the news? Jerry Sandusky, he was an assistant coach for Penn State University. I grew up in Pennsylvania. Penn State football is, is godlike in its uh, importance there in Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania. And, of course, we weren't living there at the time, but I'm reading and hearing this story break that Jerry Sandusky, the assistant coach at Penn State football, had for years been abusing young boys. And something just clicked. And I was so mad, just so angry. I'm like, I know I'm just hearing a story like everybody else, and it doesn't really affect me personally, but it did. And it really stirred something up, and here was God again, saying, Cliff, we need to deal with this. And he's pulling me, this, this little piece of cloth that is so strong, to pull me closer. And he says, you have unforgiveness in your heart. And you think this is just about you and this guy from a long time ago. Because this is years later now. He said, but it's not. Cliff, do you ever notice that when someone who's close to you that you think should have a certain amount of loyalty, a certain amount of commitment to you, when they fail you, that it's not just a disappointment, because that's always disappointing for anybody, but you get mad because there's something inside of you that you have not dealt with with that, and it's because you've not forgiven him. And he's pulling me, and I was like, oh, you've got to be kidding me, God. I haven't seen this guy. I never intend to see him again. Why do I have to even think about forgiving him? And Jesus is saying, because it's affecting your other relationships. And he's pulling me, and I'm like, okay, and Jesus said, so let me pull you a little further. First step in forgiving him, I've shared this before, is quit calling him him, that guy. Call him by name. He has a name. Yeah, but he's a monster in my mind. He has a name. If you really want me to work my forgiveness through you supernaturally towards him, it doesn't excuse what he did. It means he needs forgiveness. There's no other way. Then call him by his name and pray for him by name. Like, oh, I get so mad at God for doing that kind of stuff. Oh, and he's like, pray for him by name. And then God had me starting to pray for him, not only by name, but, I, you know, I read that Isaiah 53 passage. I've said that a thousand times here, and I put my own name in it, you know, that he was bruised for Cliff's iniquities, you know, he, he suffered for my sin. And then God's like, let me take you and stretch you a little closer to me. You pray Jim's name in with yours. Do I have to do that? I don't want to do that. And I'm mad at God, but I'm telling you, as I allow the Holy Spirit to pull me closer to him, there is a joy there that I would have never thought possible. There's a joy there on the other side of that pulling action where he says, let me pull you closer to my heart. And you think it's the worst thing ever to happen to you. Yeah, it's pretty bad, God, that you keep stirring this up. But there's a freedom. There's a joy that comes. And then I thought, okay, we finally have a handle on some of this stuff. I'm trying to work forgiveness towards Jim. I'm trying to understand how it affects and poisons other things that I do and how I relate. Okay, God, we got it. And then five years ago, 
five years ago, Vision Sunday, it was in the January. We're going to do a Vision Sunday where I try to lay out, hey, where are we at in our mission as a church? And, and God started early in the week. Cliff, I want you to share this with the congregation. And boy, oh boy, did I argue that week. There is no way that that's going to happen. One God, you know, I hate it. I hate it when I get all emotional and my voice starts to crack and I sound like a little squeaky toy that you give your dog after a while and you can't understand what I'm saying and, and you know that's going to happen, God. I'm going to start to talk about this pain in my life to the whole congregation. And I love you guys, but I'm telling you, I did not want to do that. And he, he wouldn't let me go because now it wasn't just pulling me in. He was, he was pushing me out. He was expanding me. It was new wine. And then my old wineskin was not going to stretch any further. And he's like, if you don't let go of the old cliff, it's going to break. Let me give you a new wineskin. And I, I argued with God. I didn't get any sleep that whole stinking week. That whole week, I'm just arguing with God. And really, I'm going to do this. And then I realized that I need to do it. And then I realized, because I'd only ever told Laura, I said, God, you know what this means. That means I'm going to have to call my mom because it wouldn't be right for me to share it with everybody else and not have told her. And then I'm going to have to share it with my three children who are grown and married and out of the house, but I, I owe it to them to tell them before. And I've got to do all that before Sunday. Yeah, God says, I know. So I do that. I'm totally spent emotionally, pushed beyond what I thought was even possible. But I'm telling you again, there was some joy there. And then when I stood up here five years ago and I shared that with you, and I was wasted. I was, I don't even, you could probably hear nothing. I was just trying to squeak out everything. And I was like, fine, God, are you happy? Because there it was. It was a mess, just a crying, snotty mess. And I said it. So there, are we done with this? And then the most amazing thing happened. Because that week after I shared, and the weeks to come after that, you came to me. And so many of you, came to me to share personally and I believe the statistics in fact the statistics seem like it's over like you know half of everybody here has been abused in one way or another I think it's more than that because you came to me and you began to share with me some of the deepest abuse of your life and in that moment we're sitting there and I'm crying with you and we're hugging together and those of you who are brave enough to do that I just I just want to I just tell you how much it meant that we as a church begin to see each other, I think, a little differently. Hey, we are messed up. We say that all the time, but to have that moment to share. And there was, this is the weirdest thing, I'm mad at God, and at the same time, there was joy. There was this expanding joy where I had a moment to realize we're hurting, but God has brought us together so that when we share this stuff, there is a shoulder to lean on. There is somebody who's hugging us and saying, and then you, you share this testimony that is so profoundly powerful. God is enough. I ask you, because some of you had a, a situations that were far worse than mine, far worse. And I said, how have you gotten to this point? And you basically are saying, God is enough. And there's a joy. Man, if God can get me through this, there is nothing, nothing is going to separate me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And there is a joy, but it comes when Jesus says, I'm going to pull you close, and it will feel like you are breaking. It's the old stuff breaking. The new can hold him. And I'm going to push you out. It's not going to be just about you and Jesus, but suddenly what God is doing in your life becomes ministry your deepest hurts and pains becomes your ministry to other people and God is stretching you and you think it's going to break I'm going to break down and yeah the old will but man I'm, I'm just telling you how beautiful it is when God's people say oh that's why we can feast or fast and still have this joy because he is with us he is making us new and it gives us our capacity of joy that we have never known before. In our deepest hurts, God is enough. Let's pray. Oh God, you are so, so good. 
your love, we try to compare it to so many things or people, and it is beyond compare. It's strong, strong enough to pull us to yourself, God, even when we resist. It's strong enough to push us out beyond ourselves, outside of ourselves, to touch and to, to connect with those around us. And then you show up. You show up in those moments, and there's a joy God, thank you for the reality of that, but I know that it's so hard. And right now, for hearts that are scrambling because they sense that you are moving in their lives and they're afraid they're going to stretch beyond breaking point, God, would you reveal yourself as the one who is sufficient to give them a new heart that can be pulled and stretched in ways that they've never known and is able to hold this joy? Work that in us. May we be light and salt in this world that people would recognize God must be enough for them. There's no other way to account for it. We pray that happens more and more right now in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going we're to close with this song, so keep worshiping God, but as God moves your heart, please, we're going to be available here at the doors to pray with you. Don't waste an opportunity that the Holy Spirit has prompted you. We'll pray with you about anything. Um, just come out to these doors while people are singing. Make your way out. We'll pray together. Otherwise, would you stand and let's worship our God today. Thank you.